beloved people of God, good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Sarah Deust. I'm the pastor here at Parkwood, and it is my privilege to welcome you on this glorious morning as we celebrate and worship the risen Christ. We offer a special welcome this morning to our siblings in Christ from Eastminster Presbyterian Church. We are so delighted to have you with us this morning and excited to honor um, all that you've done with the Ruth Circle and all that will be. For those of you who've been around for a while, um, you will remember that last week we had a congregational meeting to approve the terms for the roof and its replacement. I am happy to say that the roofer had an opening in their schedule and that work will begin tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, special thanks to Dan Miner who's been coordinating all of that. Um, and it should just take about a week. So, um, and you can come and go as you need to this week with the building. But exciting things happening in the life of the church. Speaking of exciting things, there is plenty to be excited about here at Parkwood. And rather than listing all of it off for you, I would refer you instead to the Parkwood Press. That is where you can get all of the information that you need every week. It comes out on Thursdays. If you don't get it and you would like to, you can either... Uh, write Parkwood Press next to your name on the friendship pads, or you can fill out one of the welcome cards that are floating around in the, in the pews. Um, all right, I know Sue has an announcement for us this morning. Thank you, good morning. Um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Sue Pretty, and um, I am again taking part in the Parkinson's Walk that will be held at Meyer Garden in October. So there's a flyer for information if you'd like to have a team, join my team, donate, whatever it would all be appreciated. Put it on the deck table. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and real quick, because I know you're all curious, the chairs that are up front are for the liturgy we'll be doing later with the Ruth Circle. So for those folks who may not be comfortable standing for long periods of time, we have the chairs up here for you so that you can come and join us. Uh, for that liturgy. So, just so you know, I know you're all wondering. Do we, have, <laughs> do we have any other announcements this morning? All right. Then, with all of that said, let us worship God together. Good morning. Good morning. We call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If it had not been the Lord, who was on our side? The God who saved Israel is still at work in this world. And now I uh, ask you to join us in hymn number 409. God is here. Stand if you're able, but uh, join us with this song.
The Apostle Paul writes, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. In sober judgment, humility, let us confess <coughs> our sin before God and one another.
prayer for illumination. Mysterious God, we trust that you are at work among us, even when you are hidden from our sight. By the power of your Spirit, open our eyes to see you, our ears to hear you, and our arms to embrace your truth. Amen. The first scripture we're reading this morning is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. And it's on page 1093 in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I bid every one among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him. As for the one body, we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function. So though our many are in the one body of Christ, and individually members of one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service are serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts and his, his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, never flag in zeal, be aglow with the Spirit, Serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first time we meet Simon, in the Gospel according to Matthew, he is a fisherman. He and his brother Andrew were sitting on the shore mending their nets when Jesus comes along and says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers for people. Both brothers leave their nets and follow immediately. They didn't know who this guy was. For all they knew, he was just another Jewish rabbi looking for disciples, which was, by most accounts, a prestigious position. So whether they were divinely guided, looking for a job with less manual labor, or just curious, they get up and they go. Jesus also calls James and John that day, the sons of Zebedee, in much the same situation. They were also fishermen. 
And over the next months and years, Peter and his new friends follow this rabbi, this teacher, and they see him work miracles. In just the last few chapters alone, Peter has seen Jesus turn five loaves and two fish into food enough for more than 5,000 people. Peter has seen him walk on water and then done it himself. He has seen Jesus fight with the established religious authorities and witness more miraculous healing than he could comprehend. Peter is not an academic. He is not a religious scholar. But he is taking all of this in, experimenting, putting himself out there, being the guy who says what everyone else is thinking. So when Jesus asks the question, who do they say I am, there are plenty of answers. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But when Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am, the only one who answers is Peter. You are the Messiah, son of the living God. Matthew's gospel has been building and building and building up to this moment. Remember, Matthew's goal is to present Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. And this is the first time in the gospel that anyone calls Jesus that to his face. Jesus might as well have thrown him a party, complete with the confetti coming from the ceiling and all of the enthusiasm that comes with getting a big prize on The Price is Right. We all remember that, right? After years of intensive, hands-on learning and discipleship, up to and including trying to walk on water like Jesus, Peter gets it. I want to drive that home, that Peter, who literally walked with Jesus, took years to figure out what was really going on. Peter teaches us over and over and over again in the Gospels, in Acts, and beyond, that being a disciple of Jesus is not just a light switch that turns on and off. It's a continual process of becoming. Discipleship is a lifelong exercise in learning, unlearning, relearning, asking more questions, experimenting, belonging, moving, wondering, witnessing, and sometimes, occasionally, being wrong out loud. <laughs> this process this process of becoming is what Paul is talking about in Romans when he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Peter's reward for his understanding and his boldness is a new name and a new leadership role amongst Jesus' followers. Now, in the Gospels, Simon, Simon Peter, and Peter are all the same person, which makes things a little confusing. But Simon was this guy's given name, and Peter is the name Jesus gave him. And so sometimes to clear up that confusion, they call him Simon Peter. So, but why Peter? How does that relate to whatever Jesus is saying about rocks? Well, it's a pun that was unfortunately lost in translation. These original conversations would have taken place in Aramaic, a language related to Hebrew. The word kepha or sifa in Aramaic literally means rock. So originally he would have been called Cephas. But when the gospels were written and the stories were told in new parts of the world outside of Aramaic speaking Judea, everything got translated to Greek. So the translators and the missionaries decided that the meaning of the name was the most important thing to keep. So they used the Greek word for rock or stone, Petros. And much later, that Greek was translated into many other languages, and that's how we get to Peter. So we go from Simon to Cephas to Petros to Peter 
in the course of like three words in the gospel according to Matthew, but it took a while in real time. And unfortunately, as soon as you explain a pun, you lose the punchline. So there's your fun fact for the day. Now, as I pondered Jesus' question this week, who do you say that I am? I was reminded of a moment between a couple colleagues of mine from several years ago. As part of the process to become an ordained minister of word and sacrament in the Presbyterian Church, every single one of us has to stand up in front of the Presbytery, a big group of pastors and elders representing <coughs> local churches and ministries for an examination. This is one of the last steps after you've completed seminary, taken all of the written tests, and received a call to a church. In this exam, anyone can ask you just about anything, which makes it slightly terrifying. <laughs> In one particular presbytery that I was part of, not this one, I need to make that clear, it is not this presbytery, <laughs> There was one minister who loved to try and get a gotcha moment out of every new pastor so that he could tell them they were wrong, and he obviously had the correct answer and was therefore superior. At one meeting, there was a young woman being examined, fresh out of seminary in her late to mid-twenties, going to work in youth ministry for a large church in another state. This pastor stood up and asked her, who is Jesus to you? It seems like a great question, right? But the rest of us knew this guy and knew that this was a trap. Because we knew that he was obviously looking for one specific phrase, but nobody could warn her about that. So she gives this beautiful, detailed answer about Jesus being the great teacher and an ever-present guide in her life, leading her to deeper love, justice, and peace. That was not good enough for the pastor who asked the question, so he continued to question her. She continued to elaborate, but she didn't know which magic words he was obviously looking for. Finally, after about five minutes of this, when the rest of us were getting restless, he gave up, and he asked the question that he really wanted to ask in the first place. Would you consider Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes, she replied, absolutely. Satisfied, he said, thank you, and sat down. <laughs> Now, most of us will not have to stand in front of a room full of people and give an account of our faith in this way. Thanks be to God, right? <laughs> but I think all of us have experienced, have known that feeling, that <coughs> desperate kind of feeling where you're trying to express yourself and the person on the other end of the conversation is just looking for a way to take you down a peg or two. <coughs> when you're trying to connect, when you're trying to be authentic, and the other person is just <coughs> listening for some magic words or secret password before they'll listen to what you have to say. I think many of us would be a little nervous to answer Jesus' question out loud in public today, because no matter how authentic our belief in what we say, someone, somewhere, even in the depths of the internet, will pop up to tell us that we're wrong. <coughs> that this or that, that this phrase is the only correct answer. It's not that we're afraid of being wrong. It's that there are so, so many people out there convinced that they are completely and absolutely <coughs> right to the exclusion of everyone else. And we're afraid of being one of them. <coughs> but I'm here to tell you, we can express our faith without being jerks. Because we know that scripture itself, 
gives us a whole world full of varied answers to this question. Brought a prop with me. This beautiful tapestry from Chuck Rocket hangs in my office. It is all the <coughs> scriptural names, not even all probably, but many of the scriptural names of Jesus. We have Advocate, Shiloh, the Resurrection and the Life, Shepherd and Bishop of Souls, <coughs> Holy One, Lord of Lords, Servant, Savior, Man of Sorrows, Head of the Church, Living Water, Bread of Life, Rose of Sharon, Alpha and Omega, the list goes on and on and on. Every time we offer a tidbit, of our lives, our faith, our hope in God, our perspective on Jesus and what he calls us to do, we offer one more window into the heart of God for someone who is desperately seeking that light. The message that Matthew offers us for us Today is that yes, absolutely, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, whom we love and we seek to follow. And there is some encouragement here to be a little bit more like Peter, who is willing to step out in faith, both figuratively and literally. For the boldness of Peter and his example for us. Thanks be to God. Friends, I'll now invite us to rise <coughs> as your evil and sing hymn number 41, a worship of you. <coughs>
Quaker Presbyterian Church as we bless and honor the legacy of the Ruth Circle. Friends, as those claimed by Christ in our baptism, we have been given work to do in this world. There are a variety of gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the spirit for the common good. God has gifted the Ruth Circle of the Eastminster Presbyterian Church of Grand Rapids with a sacred ministry these past 12 years. This woman, her name is Carol Wilmes, was kind of the brainchild of this. My understanding is she was reading Good Housekeeping one day and saw that, got this idea of getting rid of your old jewelry by selling it and then donating the proceeds. So she brought it to her Ruth Circle and what some of the women from the Ruth Circle told me is that when they first heard this, they were like, well, yeah, maybe. But they went ahead and went along with it. <clears throat> Twelve years later, they have raised over $76,000. Yeah. That has, yes. <laughs> and all of that money has gone to feed hungry children in Grand Rapids through Kids Food Basket, New City Kids and other programs like that. So I would like to invite um, the women from the Ruth Circle of Eastminster who are here today, Cher Beatty, Martha Chalmers, and Susie Heritage to come forward, please. In your bulletin is an insert that has some litany and prayers in it. And so let's begin our little service here by giving thanks to God for the work of these women and their sisters and bless them for this work faithfully done. Please join me in the litany of thanksgiving. For work imagined and lived into for the hours of your lives dedicated to this project and service in our community. We thank you and we thank our living God. For the difference this has made in the lives of families and the opening of your hearts in deeper ways to the challenges and needs in our community. We thank you and we thank our living God. For the grace to walk through struggles and deal with setbacks. For the community built, relationships nurtured, and hope freely shared. We thank you and we thank our living God. We thank you, loving God, for the privilege of being part of your work in our broken world. And we thank you for Susie and Martha and Shar and all of their sisters who followed you. And we thank you for their ministry. May they hear your words. Well done, good and faithful servants. Grant them rest and peace in Christ's name. Amen. When these faithful folks at Eastminster began looking for someone to continue this ministry, Pastor Lori reached out to me and said, do you think some folks at Parkwood would be interested? We managed to connect a couple folks from both churches, and the answer was very much yes. So I will invite the folks from Parkwood, who have been part of this Ruth Circle ministry in any way, come on up. So whether you've sorted jewelry, whether you've hauled jewelry, Come on up. If you want, you can surround these lovely ladies.
Friends, we are honored to be part of this legacy that you have built to carry on this work that you have invested so much in. So the group here at Parkwood that is continuing this ministry has decided that they too will be known as the Root Circle. As we celebrate this new season of life and ministry, let us join together in the litany of blessing. As you take on this new work, May you experience God's grace and hope. Bless, Bless and guide these women through your grave. In times of unity and times of conflict, may you experience God's wisdom and God's leading. Bless, Bless and guide these women through your grave. As you engage more deeply with the needs of this community and gain more clarity about how to partner with Christ's people. Bless and guide these women through your grave. For the hungry children in Jenison and in the greater Grand Rapids area and their families, we pray that the resources earned through this ministry will bring healing and hope. Pour out your spirit upon these women, O God. Give them creativity, intelligence, imagination, and love as they carry forth this ministry passed on to them. Grant them success and fill them with joy. In the name of God, the Creator, Christ our Savior, and the Blessed Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Women of Parkwood Presbyterian, you have received the trust of carrying on this ministry from your sisters in Christ from Eastminster Presbyterian. Do your work faithfully and with intention, and may all that you do be done in the name of Christ's love and in the power of God's Spirit. The grace of your baptism is sufficient for any calling God places upon us. May that grace fill you to the brim. Amen. <laughs> now, before you go anywhere, one of the symbols that is associated with the biblical character of Ruth is wheat. Um, and so as a symbol of your ministry and your ministry together, we have some small pendants for you in the shape of sheaves of wheat. May they be a blessing as you remember and as you serve. So I will hand some to Lori. Will you join us in giving thanks for this ministry? acceptable to God, for this is our act of worship. Our gifts differ, but all can be used to further God's kingdom. Let us receive the morning offering. <laughs>
Let us pray. Generous God, you are the source of all good gifts, and you are the one who taught us how to give. We see in our offerings and in our faith that even our small gifts have power and purpose in your world. Amen. One of our favorite traditions here at Parkwood is the sharing of joys and concerns each Sunday. So how can we pray for you, for your loved ones this morning? What do we have to share? Marie. Ask me to spill in my seat so you guys know. They decided after I sat down that I needed an oral surgeon. So prayers are me finding an oral surgeon that then that works. Absolutely. Yeah. Some dental work done this week that did not happen they referred her to an oral surgeon instead which means finding an oral surgeon that is in network and affordable and all of the other things so we will continue to pray that all of that will go smoothly for you thank you david for our fellow michiganders who lost a life property cars say that tornadoes were rare in Michigan, but in this day of climate change, I'm not sure we can say that much more. Right. Absolutely. For all those who are in the path of tornadoes and storms and flooding, um, our fellow Michiganders, as they recover and grieve and all of those things. Thank you. Jay. <clears throat> Chemotherapy round four is scheduled to begin on Wednesday. All right. Jay is scheduled for chemo round four on Wednesday um, and hoping that it occurs this time um, and that all is well with the blood work and everything that goes with that. Absolutely. Thank you. Sue. This may sound kind of strange, but um, as part of my program, um, exercise program, I'm in a boxing program, and one of the gals that boxes with us um, is also going through cancer treatment right now, and she's been in a trial, and it's been successful so far, all the reports that she's had, but this afternoon at 3 o'clock, she and our boxing coach, who has Parkinson, and her oncologist are skydiving. <laughs>
and at that meeting this chose November 19 as our last worshiping date together as a community. And so would you hold the church, the session, all of us in your prayers, as you can guess, it's a time of deep emotion, gratitude for what God has done, um, and also just lots and lots of new things. So please keep us in your prayers. Absolutely. Thank you. For all the good folks at Eastminster um, for their their ministry together as that wraps up on November 19th um, and for all that comes next with that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thought I saw one more. Linda. Prayers for my cousin Karen who's been diagnosed with cancer and she is um, scheduled, she hasn't quite been scheduled for surgery but um, her set, she doesn't know what stage it is yet it's all in the beginning. Absolutely. So prayers for Linda's cousin, Karen, who has been recently diagnosed with cancer and is figuring out all the things all at once. Thank you. Nick? Prayers for the people of the Gulf Coast in the southeastern U.S. as it looks like hurricane season is starting in earnest. Absolutely. For all those who are even in the peripheral path of hurricanes um, as hurricane season is ramping up and starting with a, a bang that nobody wants to hear. <clears throat> Any others? All right. Let's go to God in prayer together. God of love, we come to you with trust that you will hear what we offer you, that you will help us in our time of need, that you will rejoice with us in our joys. God, we lift up all those who are sick, who are recovering, who are undergoing or anticipating treatment. We pray for Marie as she looks for an oral surgeon to take on this dental work God, we pray that this would be an absolutely smooth process, that you would grant her and all those who are caring for her wisdom and patience and all of the things that she needs. We pray for Jay as he prepares for round four of chemo. We pray that his blood work will be where it needs to be, that chemo will go smoothly and once again do only what it needs to do. We pray that side effects would be minimal and that he would continue to be as well as possible. We pray for Karen as she comes to terms with this fresh cancer diagnosis. God, we pray that you would grant her healing and hope. And as she schedules things and begins meeting with doctors, God, we pray that they would know exactly what to do and how to do it to help her to be well. We also pray for Sue and her friends, uh, for Jane and Amy and the oncologist as they head out skydiving today. God, we thank you for their boldness and bravery and joy, and we pray that they would be safe, that they would enjoy this immensely, um, and that it would be a source of hope and wonder for them. God, we also pray for all those who are coping with and recovering from natural disasters. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters and siblings here in Michigan as they recover from tornadoes and storms and flooding. God, we pray that you would grant them the help that they need, that they would be able to recover and rebuild um, and do exactly what they need to do. We also pray for all those who are in the path of hurricanes this season, for the Gulf Coast, for the Eastern Seaboard. God, we pray that they would be as safe as possible, and that there would be nothing major this season that 
there would be no loss of life um, and that you would grant them your peace in all things. We also thank you for our siblings from Eastminster. We pray that as they close their ministry together, that you would surround them with love and support and joy in remembering all of the good and wonderful things that you have done among them. We pray for their session, for Lori as she leads and cares for them. God, we pray that you would be close to them in this season. We lift all of this trusting in your goodness and love for us. And now we join our hearts and our voices together in the prayer that you taught us, saying, <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, to you and give you 